Our first speaker this afternoon is Dr. Christina Maranchi. Professor Maranchi is Associate Professor of Armenian Art at Tufts University. She received her PhD from Princeton University in the Department of Art and Archaeology in 1998. She has lectured and published widely, particularly in the area of Armenian architecture. Her books include Medieval Armenian Architecture, Constructions of Race and Nation, and Vigilant Powers, Three Churches of Early Medieval Armenia. Her articles have appeared in the Revue des Etudes Arméniennes. Her articles have appeared in, in many uh, journals, such as Revue des Etudes Arméniennes and the Oxford Dictionary of the Middle Ages. Uh, Dr. Maranchi, please welcome. Um, I'm very glad to be able to participate in this conference because the topic is important and timely and also because the invitation has given me a chance to learn something new. So here's a little confession. I'm a specialist in medieval art and architecture um, and so I work for the most part in a very different time zone than that which is uh, being discussed here. And when I was asked to speak on the Armenian architects of the Ottoman Empire, um, I realized I didn't have a lot of knowledge of the subject, although of course I knew that much had been written um, about the famous Balian family. So please accept the following as a non-specialist introduction to the late Ottoman contribution of Armenian architects. And at the conclusion of this paper, I will make some general remarks about the state of the research and present some questions that arose in my mind while reading the academic literature. First, a few preliminary remarks. While one would be justified in beginning a study of Armenian architects in the Ottoman Empire uh, with the 16th century architect Sinan, the greater amount of documentation and material evidence makes it easier to discuss the period of later Ottoman rule. And so I focus here on the 19th and early 20th centuries and the Balians more particularly. In gathering the research for this subject, um, I made use of several excellent works. First and foremost, that of Pars Tulace, whose monumental role of the Balian family in Ottoman architecture of 1990 is a masterpiece of scholarship and documentation. 2011, moreover, saw the publication of the exhibition catalog entitled Armenian Architects of Istanbul in the Era of Westernization, edited by Yayuma, Yayuma Hazirlayan and published by the International Hran Dink Foundation. Um, and I thank Maggie Goshen, I can't see her right now, for in introducing me to this work. So these two works, that of the Balian and that of the, um, that of Bali, not that of um, Dulace and that of the Harant Ding Foundation, are really crucial in understanding the contributions of Armenian architects to the Ottoman Empire. There are other works as well. Um, but I'll have the I'll have occasion to mention these two particularly in this paper. So, Two important conditions in the late Ottoman Empire engender the rise of the Balian family workshop. The first involves the sweeping political, social, religious, professional, and institutional changes of the 19th century. Many scholars have noted how the broad reforms of the Tanzimat period allowed for greater, great, greater freedoms for Armenians and other non-Muslim subjects. They were allowed, for example, to build new and taller churches and to ring church bells. Second, there was a decline of the institution of the imperial architect's office, which had existed since the 15th century, and which formerly had a monopoly on construction activities. Attempts to replace this institution included a directorate and a building council, but these were not effective in carrying out projects. Into this vacuum stepped the Kalfa. The word Kalfa holds a variety of meanings and is commonly translated as apprentice. In late Ottoman society, it signified a specific architectural profession as distinguishable from the architect or mimar. In the late 18th and early 19th century, non-Muslim kalfas enjoyed tax-exempt status and special professional privileges. They were employed within the permanent core of building and given contracts to carry out building works on behalf of official bodies. 
So they could hold serious administrative power. And in 1848, for example, the Kalfas Istefan, Ohanis, and his son Artin were charged with overseeing the construction of mosques. The Balian family formed part of an elite corps of imperial Kalfas that was connected to the Sultan. According to Alison Wharton, they essentially took up the responsibilities of the imperial architect's office of the past. First, they were tied to the palace and not to one or another state office or municipality. And second, they were nominated by the Sultan himself. Third, they kept up traditional practices of architecture, including model making and presenting these models or maquettes to the Sultan. The Balians and their colleagues also enjoyed a high level of economic and procedural autonomy. They generated their own network of materials and suppliers. They were involved in all aspects of production, including planning, drawing, and decorating. Interestingly, there's evidence that they were not paid huge sums for their work. Wharton suggests that perhaps for this very reason, they sought ways to improve the efficiency of their operations in order to be competitive in the market and to make money. There was another reason for their success, the existence of a close network of Armenians in Istanbul. In the first half of the 19th century, the Armenian Kalfas served as amiras, or community leaders. They gave money to the Armenian community and took an active role in cultural and religious affairs, even trying to unite the apostolic and Catholic Armenians of the city. They rebuilt churches and monasteries, established schools, supported preachers, printed books, and promoted traditional values of Armenian theology. This tight-knit tight network was not only beneficial for the Armenian communities, the Amiras enjoyed greater means at their disposal because of the network of suppliers of materials and laborers within their community. An even more basic social unit played to the favor of Armenian architects of the Ottoman Empire, the family. There were certainly many Armenian Kalfas who were working at the imperial level, such as Ohana Serverian, Aram and his brothers Isaac Karakash, Kegan Kavafian, Yedvard Terzian, and many others, but such figures can often be tied to the operations of the Balians, whose workshops span four generations. The first recorded Balian is Bali Kalfa, who died in 1803. He came to Istanbul from Kaysari, Caesarea, and started by renovating buildings um, and woodworking. His tombstone also records that he became the imperial architect of the Sultan. His son Krikor, or Kirkor as he calls himself, Amira Balian, built on this success, as did his grandson, Garabed Am Amira, and his great grandsons, Nikolos Bey and Sarkis Bey and Hagop. As Afife Batu writes, together the Balians worked for a century and completed each other's work, generating a continuity and efficiency rarely encountered in the history of architecture. Family businesses, as we know, hold special advantages. For the Balians, this meant enjoying name recognition, a built-in list of contacts, inherited knowledge, and the security of family loyalties. Another common trait among the Armenian Kalfas, oops, what did I just do? Thanks. Another. Um, that's very ugly. Another common trait among the Armenian Kalfas, and certainly among the Balians, is their training in Paris, and more broadly, their openness to European traditions. And I'm showing you here images of, of the um, Collège, Collège Saint-Barbe, where they studied in Paris. The first three generations of Balians learned within the family tradition of craftsmanship. So for example, Krikor and Garabed, Garabed received their training at home. But Garabed sent his sons, Nikogos, Sarkis and Agop to Paris. And for the most part, as I mentioned, they enrolled in the Collège Saint-Barbe. In Paris, they came into contact with the ideas of Henri Labrust, uh, whose brother Theodore was a member of the faculty. And Henri was a, shoot, I did it again, sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm used to having an up button. 
So anyway, let me just tell you, Henri, Henri was a strong proponent, proponent of the use of Roman architectural ideas and motifs. So he thought that Henri Labrust was, was, was of the opinion that, these, that the classicizing Roman ideas could be used to stimulate a renaissance in current French architecture um, and possibly kind of cultivate the production of a national style. And so it's possible that these ideas inspired the young Armenian students in Paris and the resulting in fusion of European and classical architectural ideas into the Ottoman tradition. In this way, according to Afife Batur, the Balians and their colleagues, and I quote her, opened up Ottoman architecture from initial concept to building technology to the West. So now we come to the distinctive and dizzying new style of the late 19th century Ottoman architecture in Istanbul, which fuses a myriad of traditions, including Byzantine, early Ottoman, French Renaissance, neoclassical, Greek Revival, Baroque, Rococo, and Art Nouveau. The European elements of this style were once viewed as slavish imitation and trivial importation. New generations of Ottomanists see instead a deliberate process of appropriation in which the European and the local were selectively fused to generate a new style. Rather than decadent or derivative, the architecture of the Balians, it is now suggested, sought to create a modern imperial material identity and to revive the tradition of Ottoman architecture. Now, I want to turn to the corpus of Balian buildings, beginning with Krikor, or Kirkor, and ending with Sarkis Bey. A comprehensive list of these buildings was published uh, by Pamukjan, another great scholar of the Balians, but this list is changing as new documentation is uncovered. Um, the present list essentially constitutes, though, an index, as one scholar put it, of the official building program of the late Ottoman era. So, Krikor Balian was the first to use the Armenian surname. His dates are 1764 to 1831. He became royal architect under um, Sultan Selim III and continued under Sultan Mustafa IV and Sultan Mahmud II. Krikor controlled a large and productive workshop, which was responsible for major buildings, including palaces, summer palaces, mosques, and military barracks. The Selimia barracks, designed by Krikor not once but twice because it burned down in 1807 and was rebuilt in 1826, um, is considered, considered um, the uh, largest barracks in the world. Um, and it's located in the Uskudar district of Istanbul. And you can see it consists of a kind of large rectangular scheme with an open courtyard. The facades are strongly rhythmical, consisting of bays of three uh, registers of windows divided by pilasters. So a very sort of severe rhythmical facade. And the corner towers uh, which you can see at the upper, in the upper image, sort of, um, are framed by round arches. It's not visible here. But um, anyway, the rooms, and you see here a drawing of, um, I think this is the famous drawing of Florence Nightingale in the Silimia barracks, are spacious and well lit. But Krikor's um, most celebrated architectural achievement is the Nusretie Mosque. Constructed in the Beolu district of Istanbul in 1826, it represents a key example of what has been called Ottoman Baroque. It is instructive to compare it to um, the 16th century Suleymaniye Mosque of Sinan to see how Krikor has developed the idea of the mosque. While there are certain shared features, such as minarets and the centralized massing of the, with the dome most prominent, and I'm sorry this, 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 this thing is coming through, but maybe you can see. This is, you're looking here at the the main mass of the Nusretiyam Mosque, and of course this is the Suleymaniyah Mosque. So um, let's go to the interior. Oh, here's a, actually a view of the exterior of the Nusretiyam Mosque. And what you want to note here is the sort of cohesion that Krikor creates by organizing the windows in the arched area so that they create um, line, direct, sort of direct axis going up. So you get this strong sense of verticality through the two tiers, this tier and this tier of the building. So there's a sense of overall cohesion that's created through the design and placement of the windows. Um, the interior also creates a sense of strongly unified space um, dominated by the dome. And in the, um, here's the dome, and then the Mirab niche is particularly interesting because here you can see the use of classical features. Um, and let me see if I can, so here you see these kind of pilasters um, 
with capitals that might remind you of classical European buildings. And European trends also inform the sebil, or fountain, next to the mosque, um, which you see on the left, as well as that curving staircase. Garabed Amir Abalian was the son of Krikor. His dates are 1800 to 1866. He was brother-in-law to the Cerverians too, which shows the interconnectedness of the Kalfas. He was hugely prolific. He worked during the reigns of Mahmet II, Abul Majid, and Abul Abdulaziz, and built mosques, barracks, churches, palaces, pavilions, dams, factories, hospitals, schools, and the list goes on. He was an expert in the construction of domes, and he was originally commissioned to renovate the dome of the Hagia Sophia, but the commission fell through. Um, he did, though, repair the Dome of the Rock um, in Jerusalem in 1853. Uh, his most celebrated work is the Dolma Bache Palace, which was opened in 1856 and located in the Beshkitash district of Istanbul, right on the European coastline of the Bosphorus. Hailed as the most magnificent building of 19th century Istanbul, the Dolma Bache is m a massive structure, 300 meters long, with 285 private rooms and 46 reception rooms, each uniquely and sumptuously decorated. Set directly on and echoing the coastline, it presents, um, as we saw before in the um, Selimiya barracks, a strong regularity of masses um, and a rhythmic division of upper and lower zones. So you're looking at the main facade here. Here, however, there is more sculptural decoration um, creating that grid-like form. Um, and you can see here a really rich language of classical architecture with double attached columns, tall imposts um, that are carried all the way through to the roof line. So, so here, just like we saw with Krikor, you get this strong sense of carrying, um, uniting different registers of a building through architectural features, in this case using those pilasters. Um, the interior of the Dolma Bache is, is an essay in luxury, and here we should remember that the Balians were not only designers of the exterior and of architecture, but also, as documents show, closely involved in all aspects of the decoration of the interior. Um, Garabed was also responsible for the nearby uh, Dolma Bache Mosque. Oh, here's just a detail of the stairway, which is, I think, just beautiful. And here, before you saw the, a the atrium with the glass ceiling, and then the stairway, you see a detail of that here. So, oh, and I think I have one more. Look at that, just gorgeous, I think. <laughs> and, um, okay. All right, so he also was responsible for the nearby Dolma Bache Mosque, um, sharing certain features with his father's Nusratia Mosque. Garabed introduces here a distinctive feature which has been referred to as a wheel window in which radial fenestration accents the arches of the facade. So I'm referring to right here. Um, on the interior, this large glazed area emphasizes Garabed's skill at dome construction, surely kind of showing the weight of the dome transferred to the corner pendentives and leaving this whole area really glazed so you get this sense that, wow, he can really build because uh, obviously if he couldn't, he wouldn't have opened up that area so extravagantly. Um, his, engineer, his engineering skills were also put to work on major dam projects such as the Valide Dam, dam in the Belgrade forest of Istanbul. So Garabed was not just prolific in architecture but also in making babies. He had nine children. Um, four, four of them became architects, Nikolos, Sarkis, Agob, and Simon. And, um, and four became architects and attained the title of royal architect. All studied at the Collège saint Barbe. And Nikogos, whose dates are 1826 to 1858, um, was the first Balian to receive a professional degree there. So he, Nikogos was appointed by the Sultan Abdul Majid as royal architect and artistic advisor. And among his most celebrated uh, works is the audience hall in the Dolma Bache Palace. Measuring a vast 44 by 46 meters, it features high arches supported on Corinthian capitals, deep niches, and trompe l'oeil painting in the ceiling. Um, also notable are his monumental ceremonial um, portals, which we saw earlier in uh, Van Arroyan's talk. Uh, these again of the Dolma Bache Palace. So here we might think of a prototype, I'm sorry that there's the glare coming off there, but we might think of a prototype in a Roman uh, triumphal arch. You see the Arch of Constantine down there. Um, but Nikolos has, oh, five minutes, that's fine. Nikolos has transformed the basic unit with a profusion of Baroque ornament. Um, 
and detail, including a portico, volutes, garlands, all kinds of things. The same interest in enlivening regular architectural masses with surface ornament can be seen in his Kujuksu Pavilion, or Summer Palace, completed in 1857, and his Ilamur Pavilion, um, finished in 1860. Uh, Nikogos, together with his sons, Sarkis and Agop, was also responsible for um, constructing the Chiragan Palace for Sultan Abdul Aziz, constructed between 1863 and 1867. When Garabed died in 1866, Sarkis took over the workshop. Sarkis was not only architect, but a painter, an inventor, and a pianist. He employed five or 6,000 workers, and he was a talented networker with famous friends, a brilliant personality, apparently, and had the support of brothers Nikogos and Ago. Research attributes to him over 50 buildings alone, including pavilions, palaces, mosques, hunting kiosks, row houses, the Ministry of War building, today part of the Istanbul um, University, uh, the armory headquarters and schools. And he was also responsible for completing the Chiragan and Beyer Beli palaces, which had been designed by his father and brother. His most successful years are considered to be between 1861 and 1876, when his patron was Sultan Abdul Aziz. The Beyer Beli palace, finished in 1865, is a two-story building rise on a, rise, rising on a high basement and located on the Asian side of the Bosphorus. The facades are classicizing. Um, but the inside, on the inside, sobriety gives way to an explosion of color, material, and ornament. The interior um, features splendid rooms with marble, gold, crystal, mother of pearl, and other luxury materials. That's a chandelier. At the Chiragan Palace, too, there is a fascinate, fascinating distinction between the regular rhythms of the exterior and the flamboyant sensory experience of the interior. Um, and here we can see Sarkis melding classical European and Ottoman styles. Um, note the geometric designs that might be inspired by Seljuk or later architectural ornaments or the star-shaped um, decoration of the ceiling. Um, in contrast, I would say, um, in contrast to the work of Garabed, we can see here the fusion of styles at a really, really um, fine level. Um, and and I, I want you to turn your attention to the, these columns, classical columns, which use undercut arabesque motifs. So is he trying to create a new order here, quite literally, a new architectural order? Recent scholars suggest he was deliberately trying to generate a neo-Ottoman style which appropriated Oriental themes and combined them with European and Greco-Roman vocabularies. This complex, vibrant, and thoughtful style is now considered a touchstone of late Ottoman architecture and maybe of the empire more generally. That Sarkis was thinking more broadly and deeply about the future of the Ottoman Empire is further suggested by a fascinating cache of documents which show that he had hopes of establishing a new school for Ottoman arts and industry. In 1881, he petitioned for this school and provided it with sample syllabi and a detailed description of students' activities. Just just a little bit. He said that students should get up at sunrise, make their beds promptly, brush their clothes, polish their shoes, and wash themselves with cold water. Monthly reports would be sent to the students, and novel reading was forbidden. But on the good side, um, forbidden also were physical or humi humiliating punishments. Pleasure outings included swimming and music, and courses included language, math, science administration, gymnastic training, musical training, model making, and oil painting. Um, art and architectural history courses included classical civilizations, but also Africa and East Asia. And this is a fascinating piece of information showing the prehistory of what we think of as modern world art courses. So to conclude. The Armenian Kalfas, and most of all the Balians, played a major role in the history of the late Ottoman Empire. They present an important, if largely neglected, chapter in the history of the architectural profession. Their huge influence on the built culture of Istanbul is still palpable and also demonstrated in documentation. That scholars are starting to recognize these points speaks to an important change in the, the academic and the public climate made clear by the recent publication and exhibition of the Harant Dink Foundation, and exemplified by the urging therein of Afi Batur to bring awareness to the fact that, and I'm quoting her, these individuals and their products are legitimate and indispensable elements of the history of this city, unquote. As further work surely unfolds on this subject, I would like to pose three questions for consideration. The first regards architectural style. How should we discuss the style that emerges within the context of the Balian workshop? It has been called hybrid, but for me this biologically rooted term does not adequately capture creative and dynamic explosion of different visual ideas present, for example, in the pavilions of Nikolos or the Dolmabache interiors. 
truly in light of the many surviving buildings, archival records, and theoretical tools at the disposal of historians, there is an opportunity to refine our conceptualization of the style. The second question regards women. It seems obvious to me to ask where they are. Given the importance of the family ties of the Balians and the upbringing of so many sons, what can we say about the wives, daughters, and sisters? Tulacha includes some precious photographs of the Balian women. Here's one of them. Here's another, another two, two women that were associated with the Balians. Is there anything in the written documentation that can tell us more? Obviously, there are constraints and conventions that might make this difficult, but one has to wonder what could be teased out about these women who would have held privileged access to the architectural culture of Istanbul. The third question, and for me the most interesting, concerns the medieval Armenian tradition. How much did the Balians and their colleagues know or think about it? Uh, it is documented, for example, that Garabed Balian went to Ani. Did Garabed know of Tirdat, the late 10th, early 11th century Armenian architect of Ani Cathedral, who was brought to Constantinople by the Byzantine Empire Emperor to repair the dome of the Hagia Sophia? It is interesting that Garabed also had a brush with that job. And one can detect, and can one detect, echoes of the Armenian buildings in the work of the Balians or other Armenian architects in Istanbul? We can see the clear medieval sources in the 1965 Church of Galata Sur Prikor. But what about the constructions of the Ottoman era? When we think about the power of the medieval Armenian architectural tradition, the standing monuments surely known to the Balians and their compatriots, the antiquarian interests cultivated while in Paris, Sarkis's commitment to the study of historical style, styles of diverse regions, when we see all this, we expect to see Armenian building ideas surfacing somewhere, anywhere, in the Ottoman architecture of Istanbul. That the monuments do not, at least to my eyes, demonstrates, demonstrate any clear link with the Armenian medieval past is itself interesting, suggesting perhaps a deliberate omission rather than ignorance of the material, and that itself is worth investigating. So with these questions, I conclude my presentation. There is surely a great amount of work to be done on the Armenian architects of the Ottoman Empire, and it is to be hoped that the achievements of the architects such as the Balians will be integrated into future histories, histories of Ottoman architecture and architectural history more generally. And if recent publications are any indication, this process is already underway. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dr. Ronald Marchese. He received his PhD from New York University and has a distinguished career in archaeology, having conducted research at the Platea Archaeological Excavation in Greece and at Tel Dor in Israel. He is the author of numerous articles and book chapters in the field. He is the author, together with Marlene Bro, of Splendor and Spectacle, the Armenian Orthodox Church Textile Collections of Istanbul. He has authored several other books on art and weaving. His new publication, Sacred Relics and Artifacts from the Armenian Churches of Constantinople. Dr. Marquesi. Okay, it should be the man. There we go. Uh, as usual, I'm not going to have a chance to finish this because it's uh, all I could suggest for all of you is to possibly buy the book. It's almost 500 pages, uh, along with a tremendous amount of, uh, of material, uh, including a substantial number of pieces that have never been either examined or studied or photographed uh, before. So uh, please bear with me if I will use up all the time. This is uh, one of the pieces, one of my favorite pieces uh, in the patriarchal collection and the title Metal and Other Objects of the Armenian Orthodox or Apostolic Churches of Constantinople, Treasure of Faith. Uh, the book uh, is uh, in press right now. We're going through the final editing process. Oh boy. <sighs> oh, I know what I did wrong. I punched the top button. That's why. It's the side button. Uh, this is the uh, front page of it. Uh, volume 2 is impressed and should be out at the end of this year, early next year. The volume also includes a CD catalog of objects. Uh, it's a very detailed catalog of over 123 pages alone, over 400 pages of text, and approximately 150 uh, plates in color. If you want, uh, please contact me. My email address is at the bottom. I could give you more information on a personal basis uh, when it's going to be uh, coming out. 
in the foreseeable future. Unfortunately, again, since this conference is focusing on a time period from around 1700 to about 1900, uh, there are very few surviving objects dating from before the year 1600, both in the textile format as well as within uh, those pieces that have been, would have been donated to individual churches. There are over 2,000 churches alone in Anatolia prior to the events of 1915 and thereafter. Certainly the architecture is the shell or the container for the holding of religious objects, quite obviously. But what happens to the objects? The objects themselves are also consecrated with holy oil and are viewed as gifts to God, not just the Bibles and the sacred texts and the scriptural writings, but also chalices, uh, altar ornamentation, um, many items. As long as they are consecrated, they are part of the general treasury of individual churches. Much of that material has not survived. It has not survived the ravages of war, the ravages of time, the general use, because most of those were made in gold and silver and encrusted with a variety of gemstones. If you place them in the appropriate context, quite obviously the Ottomans never had a coherent monetary policy, and subject nations or millets were held responsible for making up the shortfall within the Ottoman currency uh, concerns. And so periodically, gold and silver was called in from those artisans that made artifacts for the secular community as well as the religious community. And churches, including the Patriarchate, was responsible for making donations. And so this material was melted down Vestments were ver burned after the jewels were extracted to pay part of the tax. And so buildings are not destroyed, but the movable objects in which they are contained within are. Uh, population distribution, we saw this a little bit earlier. This diaspora of Armenians is very well connected. And yes, groups from as far away as India did contribute uh, artifacts and items to the Patriarchate in Constantinople. <clears throat> Excuse me. Again, we had used this before in terms of the migration uh, and the draw that Istanbul or Constantinople had after 1461. Individuals of talent, artisans, craftsmen, and those educated, those individuals that carried a specific designation, such as Amira, which appears later on, or Aga, or Hoja, or Chalebi. Many of those families from the East migrated to Constantinople because of the valuable commissions they may either have gained from the Ottoman authorities or from the newly defined patriarchate. And quite obviously, as the population increased, there was an increase in the number of churches that were needed to serve the religious needs of the Armenian millet. Uh, again, we've used this before uh, in terms of widespread distribution of Armenian Orthodox churches, approximate neighborhoods, not only by area, but also by density. And by far, some of the greatest of the densities are in the area around the uh, Patriarchate with the star that is Kumkapi, Yenikapi, Samatia, and also, excuse me, in the, uh, 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 and also the industrial areas uh, towards uh, Bakirkoi, which is the one in the red circle. Also towards the shipyards and the galley yards on the other side in the new city in the Para area in Beolu and Galatia. There was a large Armenian population and there are churches still there that are functioning. If we look at uh, the distribution of jewelers, since I try to prepare this uh, presentation with the jewelry, the Kuyum Jular, the jewelers guilds specifically because they produce not only secular objects but also religious objects for the individual churches. 33 and 16 in Yeni copy, 33 in Kop copy, 6 in, in Top copy, uh, sorry, Kum copy, Yeni copy, Top copy, Samatia, 31 individual jewelers. These are families and they included not only silversmiths but guilders and especially engravers who placed the donation inscriptions on the objects that were donated. These are the rank and file Armenians that animated the Armenian community. These were not the emirs of the 165 or so names of the elite. 
that controlled the Armenian millet. Individuals like uh, Haruti and Bejian, the Balian family, and others. Again, if we take a look at the distribution of where these jewelers were, heavy concentrations, which also indicate the domination of those neighborhoods predominantly by Armenians. But there were Armenians and there were Greeks and there were Turks working for each other. Greeks worked for Armenians, Armenians worked for Turks, Turks worked for Armenians, especially when we come down to the trades and the jewelry trade or jewelry guild with the head, the bash or bashir of the guild, uh, certainly ruled over a substantial number of other individuals besides Armenians. <clears throat> the uh, organization uh, in the area of Kumkapi, the Patriarchate, densely populated areas of Inekapi and Kumkapi, <clears throat> Also a mixed neighborhood including the Greek, including Greeks and Greek Basilica. The Patriarchate by tradition formed in 1461. The earliest Armenian church in the city is 1306 and it was shared certainly with, uh, uh, with others, especially the Venetians. Uh, Macedonian dynasty was purely Ar Armenian in terms of its heritage. 20, people don't realize, but 25% of the Byzantine army after 1000 or slightly before were Armenians. Why doesn't much material exist for those individuals? Very simple. They simply became Byzantine. They absorbed themselves into the dominant culture of the period. And they did, we could use the term, they simply became Byzantine in nature. Uh, artisanship expressed in metalwork, and we're going to go uh, very quickly because there's a tremendous amount of slides if we could get it to work. By the 17th century, the evolution of the Constantinople style, also in metalwork, uh, patterned an increase in the Armenian population of the city. Continuous Armenian immigration from the eastern, central, and western areas of Anatolia infused the city with a number of regional and sub-regional styles. By the 18th century and beyond, European influences mixed very nicely with this oriental influence coming from the east. And in this manner, what it's created is a diverse population that is quite cosmopolitan in nature, as was discussed earlier uh, uh, this morning. Uh, I think we're going to pass this. It's too much to read uh, and so forth, so we'll get into the material. We do have a combination of those items that are certainly uh, indicative of an early stylistic interpretation. But on these objects, there are a tremendous number of inscriptions that are very important. And this one is very important. This holy radiance is a memory of the boys who are in Istanbul for the enjoyment of St. Theodore's Church, Amen, in Kaiseri. Forced labor was not uncommon in the high point of the Ottoman Imperial period, certainly in the 19th century. Uh, Janissar Corps of the Sultans of the 15th and 16th century was originally formed of Christian captives. And they came later on in the 17th century, including Armenians from Bosnia, Greece, Bulgaria, and Armenia. Now, since what is called the Sertagun was constantly practiced, since the Ottomans did not use slavery, but they did impose a head tax upon those subject peoples, which gave them the right to commandeer individuals from the foreign communities. When we say foreign communities, we're meaning the non-Muslim millets. And that's what this is probably a dedication to, those boys taken and possibly taken for the galley yards in the Golden Horn, in which they never returned. Okay? Now, the population in the galley yards eventually became large enough of Armenians that at least four churches in that region were given firmans to be constructed for the religious needs of the Armenian population. A variety of uh, altar ornamentations. These are reliquaries in nature. Uh, the one uh, closer to me is a, of an older style, uh, possibly being drawn more so from the Eastern tradition, whereas we see the European uh, Rococo and Baroque ornamentation that starts to appear certainly in the early 19th century and thereafter. The workmanship is superb. These are actually one-of-a-kind, standalone artistic representations of religious art. 
We have altar crosses that are influenced heavily by some of the Greek Orthodox material. Uh, on the other side is a uh, processional cross placed on either a post or used as an ornamental cross on an altar and the inscription is there. Very interesting. This holy cross is in memory of an usta. An usta is a person who is the foreman of a work gang. He's not of the aristocracy. That's why the title we use for this book, Treasures of Faith, because it came from the rank and file. Individuals that had the money to repair churches, to initiate the petition at the Divan, to gain the Furman, like the Balians and others, belong to the Amira class, and yes, their names appear on the front of those churches to hang a name, your name, on a building. But the real treasures of faith come from, you know, the organizer of a work gang. And then the wife's name at the gate of the Holy Cross Church in Uskadar, the richest of all the Armenian uh, communities, 1229 or 1780. Again, another uh, very interesting personal cross uh, it's uh, enshrouded with gold on the sides, diamonds, some will have uh, freshwater pearls, but the carvings are scenes of obverse and reverse uh, in wood. Woodworking was one of the highest traditions within the Armenian working class. They were notorious as brilliant carpenters and obviously employed certainly by the architects like the Balians and others that employed people like this to produce the interior designs of the Domabaje Palace and other palaces for the Ottoman elite. Other reliquaries are quite simple in nature, but yet quite elegant. And we have again a very long inscription where the artistic achievement of the calligraphy enhances the physical object. In this holy reliquary, the benefits uh, the, uh, of the, are the bene beneficent relics of the saints, Blessed Apostle Thyatias, the Holy Virgin, uh, Herpsene, and the Patriarch Aristake. They are intercessors before the Lord, blah, 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 blah. And then we have the people that dedicated. This was by far the oldest piece we had seen so far in the collections, dated to 1745. Again, the Patriarchate was established in 1461. A uh, very important cross here is of the Patriarch John or Hovannes the Ninth. This is the person that was instrumental in establishing the great and second, I should say, the second great renaissance of Armenian art in the Armenian tradition, beginning under his Patriarchate and direction in the early 1700s. The, the cross was dedicated by the agent of the papacy, and the cardinal is listed as such, and it, is, uh, it was uh, uh, initially going to go to Jerusalem. Uh, Patriarch Hovannes IX died in 1741, so this obviously came after his, after his demise, or 1743, sorry. Uh, the central uh, a cartouche, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the image, uh, no doubt, because it does have Greek lettering, probably comes from a Greek artisan, but all the rest is of Armenian manufacture, including the enameling of the inscription. Uh, again, uh, patriarchs could wear up to three crosses, and some of the jewelry work, again, uh, denotes that work from the artisans of Kumkapi and Yenikapi, and certainly elsewhere. Many of these could be gifts given either by the family members to a person that became a patriarch, or by very dear friends uh, uh, to, uh, to give to the patriarch in order to be worn during his patriarchate. And so, unfortunately, none of these have any stamps of the jewelers. We do not know the families that made them. They are anonymous overall. We, we do get vestries. This is one of the very old ones, dated to 1787. And again, you can see the inscriptions. Some of the inscriptions have the places where they, the people came from, again, from the east. And then they list the people uh, of his wife, Anna, who is alive. They're living and asleep family members at the gate of the holy archangels in Balat. Balat was a mixed neighborhood of Jews as well as Armenian Orthodox. Now, hundreds if not thousands of relics without their encasements of gold and silver hinder a deeper understanding of the artistic trends that take place between 1700 and 1900. 
Very simply, though that material as the encasement, which includes all of the inscriptions, what the relic is and who donated it are gone because they were either of gold or silver or gilded silver. The relic was taken out and the base metal, which was gold and silver, was weighed as part of the contribution that the patriarch was forced to make or the individual church was made, had to make to the Ottoman authorities, especially in times of war. So of the thousands upon thousands of objects that graced the churches and the patriarchate itself, only a small percentage from Constantinople exists. By far the greater size of the collection is at Etchmiadzin and in Jerusalem, far away from the Ottoman authorities of Constantinople. And yet, no one has made an attempt to study the uniqueness of the contributions of the largest Armenian community in the world at that time from those collections. Who they were, what they donated on their pilgrimages, either from textiles or from the objects which included reliquaries. No attempt at all to try to isolate and understand the emergence of a specific style that enhanced the architectural splendor, the interior architectural splendor of Constantinople Armenian churches. And this is just again boxes upon boxes of relics. Now we go into the style. This is done in a French style. It's dated 1845. We can see the symbol of silver on the bottom. There is a date with a, with a crest above the date in the second one from the left. The Ottoman Sultan's signature, his Torah, and then the assayer's mark to prove that it is indeed of gold and silver at a specific carat or value level, 925. The one to the right is probably a family insignia or crest, but we don't know because no one has studied any of these. We know that families in that chart that I provided you, that comes from the patriarchal records, but these were families, <coughs> brothers, sisters, cousins, uncles, grandparents, all in the same occupation and under the control of a guild head or guild master. Uh, we also have items that are specifically inscribed with the word uh, tuklit imitation. Tuklit, okay, imitation. That is, it's not gold or silver, but it's an imitation of one that is made in gold and silver, except this is of brass and was gilded in silver. So already making a statement, don't worry, this one's not real, don't take it, okay? When we, when we look at some of the items, they're done in multitudes, in pairs of two to four to six that are used in processions, and they do narrate a story, the story of the Passion of Christ. And if we take a look at the one over on the far left and the image on the veil, that's what it looks like. Christ looking back upon the image after his face had been wiped in the process of carrying the cross. And yet if you're two feet away, you cannot see the image at all. There is no reason for it to be there, but the extra work that is done indicates the fact that what is donated is very pious in nature and it is of the best quality that the individual can produce. And yet the person that made the object we have no idea who they are. Five minutes. Five minutes? Okay. Uh, some of the best examples are going to be in your chalices. One of a kind pieces, the cup of life. Uh, this motif was the only one we saw out of the heart of Christ, that is the sacred heart, flows the elixir of everlasting salvation and life. Into the vat and then from the vat of grapes, the drink of life. We have uh, incense containers that imitate architectural features. We have the Myron doves that are used uh, in the process of holy oil. And this one is very rare. I talked about this a couple nights ago. It shows Pentecost. And the detail work is superb. It is a one-of-a-kind, true artistic piece constructed by a master. 
Okay. Then there are small little chas. These are little ornaments hanging from chandeliers of silver, beautifully cast, separate parts and welded together and then donated. This comes from uh, the Church of the Holy Resurrection, sometimes called the Fisherman's Church in Kumkapi. This was basically donated by the rank and file that used the church. These are the people that are the Kayekjas, the Hamals, other individuals like this, the ones that animated Armenian society. Over to the left, uh, sorry, over to the far right is a patriarchal pendant, and the one, the desk of filigree silver, which was an Armenian specialty, making this very fine wire for thread as well as for filigree work, uh, is the writing desk of a patriarch of the mid to late 19th century. We have walking staffs of Vardapeds. This is, uh, the, the previous one was, was, was of the uh, patriarch Golod the Ninth. There are others that the the real issue is the head of the staff with the two serpents and so forth. Done in a variety of precious stones, okay, emeralds as well as rubies and beautiful cast gold. Uh, crowns were in uh, cast metal work. Again, this was all part of the general treasuries of individual churches. So in a litany of events, the historical events here deal with uh, St. Gregory, uh, Father, Christ, and then the Holy Spirit in between the two. Uh, ornamental altar pieces, dated 1831, uh, in memory of uh, Haruti and Bejion, which the people at Holy Cross did not even know that this was a donation in memory of their most important parishioner. Uh, we get lamps and censers, manufactures and donated in pairs, uh, 19th century reliquary arms overall, the litany of material is beyond comprehension. It includes everything. Boxes, incense boxes, Nellio work, which, which was predominantly for the secular market, was also used to carry the Eucharist, the blessed bread, to those individuals to receive communion at home that were sick or could not make uh, to, the, to the services. Uh, we get our Myron doves, again, very typical in nature. We get a musical instrument and a funnel for the chrism, for the holy oil to be made and to put, be poured into a general container. We get uh, water years. This is filled with musical instruments. And we can even see over to the top, hopefully it'll work. That's right, well, right there. There's that bell that we saw in the previous slide. Chalices of all types. Some are unique and exquisite examples of the jeweler's art. This is all made by jewelers. And I'm going to try to end with these down here and we'll forget the rest. But some are done in very naturalistic, with naturalistic bases and uh, central pillars to support the cup of life. Okay? Here we have the birth of Jesus. One of the very few examples where we get <coughs> Joseph in the picture. The creation of Eve out of Adam with the Almighty Father to the, to the far side. This animates the lower base of the chalice, the baptism of Christ by John. Altar reliquaries, then there are covers for uh, the uh, scriptures, Bible and so forth. There are belts of wire, gold wire, and some that, have, that are larger will usually have uh, the immaculate uh, uh, conception as the image, Gabriel and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Mother of God. Other items include Eucharistic stamps and tiles. This is St. Theodore. Don't call him St. George. St. Theodore, please, and the dragon. That's a much older story than the story of St. George. Okay. Who were the Armenians that made the donations? <clears throat> Let's try to at least get to some of the colophones, okay, and then I will be more than happy to take questions. But it's the inscriptions that provide a tremendous amount of information. This is very important because it's one of the very few that we have of, from one of the Amiras, the holy relic of the venerable wood of life, which Shahak Amira of Akin received from the renowned Hagop Amira, that is the Amiras exchanged relics. There was a trade in relics. It's no da donated to the Holy Church of Beshiktash, Holy Mother of God Church, now girded, now we hear all of the good stuff, girded with gems and silver it is bequeathed to the same church in memory of the souls of Miss Herpsene, daughter of Ivanes 
Amir Artation, the royal superintendent of ammunition, who was an Armenian in 1856. But then we get others that really are interesting. Opposite the iron post at Kumkapi, urged by barber customers and being of the same mind with them, they gave this from the righteous earnings of all to the magnificent and wonderful St. Nicholas Church in Topkapi for the souls of the living and those asleep. Whichever the officiating priests read this holy gospel, we beg him to remember all of us during the divine liturgy and before the immortal Lamb of Christ. This was written by the sinful and worthless deacon Tomas of Constantinople in 1833. My favorite. And we'll end it with this one. Many of the people in these congregations realized that the donations of their ancestors had been given away to the Ottoman authorities. And this one places a curse on anybody who dares do this. And read it. Given to the Church of St. Gregory the Illuminator in Galata, in memory of the souls of Father Marticos, the saintly priest and his son, Arakel Aga, who is asleep in Christ. Let those who buy or sell this be eliminated from the register of life. And those who enjoy using it, remembered before the Lord of the souls who are asleep in Christ. Thank you. Thank you.